You know, around here last year, I can honestly say we had more bucks on the property than does, and part of it's because we didn't focus on that summer food. And so, and we had lots of bucks. You know, they want, they want an area they can call their own. Now, if does and fawns aren't on the property, it tells you it's not attractive, and it's not, it's not going to attract bucks on either. The bucks are not there because of the does. They're there because the track, the habitat's attractive. And if there's too many does there, those bucks won't be there. It's a hard concept for people to understand, but it's not that you're not going to have any does during the hunting season. Lights, camera. Follow the trail. Ready to shoot. If you know where a deer's bedding and you know where he's eating, that deer should be dead. Camera. If you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching. I've got 30 bucks in the Michigan record book. Everyone but one has had at least one previous wound on his body. Some had as many as four. <laughs> Trail Cam Radio. From the guys at Exodus. All right, we are live, and where are we at? We're in the trophy room from <laughs> Jeff's <Yeah. laughs> it's Pretty incredible. Yeah, so uh, we rolled into town yesterday about what was what time was it <laughs> these days have blurred together uh, up to this point a little after three a little after three yeah. three thirty and uh did a farm tour really cool white tail uh, cribs white tail cribs and uh, recorded some videos out here but today the goal is to answer some questions that were sent in um thanks for having us here oh sure yeah it's great having you guys here finally yeah, yeah we <laughs> finally get the house a... ready a little bit yeah. and our coordinator schedules so yeah. this is uh been looking forward to you guys coming for a long time yeah, it's been uh, it's been cool to. This, I love the my favorite thing of this place is the floors. By <laughs> yeah, far. that's so cool. Um, so they came out of a factory in Milwaukee, right? That was a story. Yeah, okay. they were reclaimed out of there. Some old old floors. Uh, I mean, they still uh, and it's cool because you see that nowadays they try to duplicate these on uh, laminate flooring or whatever it might be. But uh, um, this is the real stuff, and we found quickly that to duplicate this. And get it just right, you know, do the same thing. For one, we couldn't put it downstairs where we wanted to on the concrete. But then, uh, two, it's incredibly expensive and hard to find. So, if not impossible. Yeah. So, we ready to dive into the questions? Sure. Okay. So, we posted a um, swipe up basically on our Instagram page. And we have a bunch of, a wide spectrum of questions. And so, I love to start with literally the first one. We have the Slick 7. It's actually a pretty funny name. Uh, what's the first to-do item on a small parcel? Fairly flat, ten-year-old timber. I'm gonna guess he has one of those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's hard because uh, a lot of times the uh, or he's asking for a friend. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, with a small parcel, it's crazy because what's a small parcel to someone? You know, I think I like small micro parcels, five acres, ten acres, and um, and then if you're in open ag land and you don't have any room for food, then cover cover you know making it thick deer still have to be able to move through it but really on an average size small parcel whether it's 40 80 120 whatever you consider i'd see my average size parcel clients i go to is around 100 acres but half my clients are 60 acres or less mm. so whatever that size equals uh really uh food is critical so i look at you have to be able to access the property get on and off without spooking deer so the access determines where food's at and then the food determines where access is not Mm -hmm. So you can't walk through that food after. So the two, it's kind of which came first, chicken or the egg. You have to have both. And with food and access, then that'll determine where your stands go. After stands, I like mock scrapes, camera locations. And, you know, really that's that foundation right there. Once you have your access, your food sources, your stand locations, mock scrapes, cameras, then, um, then really uh, screening, effectively screening, so you can actually get on and off the property better. Uh, switchgrass is a quick, um, quick jump start to that in most areas. As long as you get full sun, it's not too soil specific, and it can give you six to eight feet of uh, screening within two years. So something really quick, cheap, and doesn't take much time. So that's where we started here in Minnesota. That um, was, that's where we started yeah. in uh, Wisconsin on our 30 acre parcels. The same here mm -hmm. on 178. <clears throat> is you know you're you're looking at food determines the foundation of movement. You have to have that. And the switchgrass here was. The biggest surprise to me a lot of switchgrass and yeah. like a lot of a lot of uh like a lot of the edge of the timber there yeah. it feels like there's some good edge already and then the additional switchgrass i don't know i it has surprised me yeah how much yeah well and it's you know here it's crazy because we have long linear chunks of timber and out of our acreage you know let's say we have 245 acres now about 35 of that is edge or field mm -hmm. you know field edge food plot mm -hmm. 
And so out of that, we're planting 15 and a half acres in food. We have nine, around nine acres, 10 acres in switchgrass screening. And then uh, we'll have some pollinator blends, and then there's some natural um, vegetation we're keeping too, uh, apple trees, shrub mm -hmm. cover. Um, but, yeah, that was – we have so much because it's so linear. Mm -hmm. It's just long. We have almost three miles of uh, field edge. Three miles. Yeah, because yeah. if you, know, you think about that yeah. farm field, we go all the way around yeah. on the inside, all the way down this way, and there's all the little coves, and it goes around top up north, so there's a lot of edge. Mm -hmm. And so we use switchgrass to just just to make sure we can get in and out, and that's a it's a short term investment that has long term implications. It lasts for decades, and in a lot of cases, we're using our edges for food plots. So if we're putting conifers or anything tall, it's going to shade out our long linear food plots that we have. I was wondering about that yeah. as we were going through because there wasn't um, you know a lot of guys will plant different types of yeah conifers, evergreens, and, and mm -hmm. use that for for screens um, or additional edge, but yeah, I was wondering. About and what's that last nice time. is you can. We have some uh, switchgrass edging that we've had eight to ten years in Wisconsin, and um, we've cut it back to where it's really thick. It's very tall, mm -hmm. and it's only three, four feet wide. Mm -hmm. So we're um, we're a conifer. You can't just plant a four foot wide conifer. Yeah. That's always going to be. Right. And so that switchgrass, we can have extremely good screening. You can't see through it even in November, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not taking a lot of food plot space. So when you have, you saw some of the food plots, if we put eight feet of switchgrass all around it, we'd cut half our food plot down. Yeah. So just a thin strip here, a thin strip there, mm -hmm. goes a long ways in screening. Yeah, makes sense. Do you think that's usually one of the um, easiest holes in the bucket to fix is screening as far as, on farms that you're on? As far as uh, using switchgrass, yes. Yeah. Um, there's some long-term screening, like uh, miscanthus grass. It's a good product um but it's it's tall expensive and takes a few years to come in and if you have poor soil it takes seven eight nine years good soil i've heard three to four years but i haven't seen that that often even in all my travels but miscanthus grass is outstanding under power lines because if you need that height then you can't plant conifer conifers any mm -hmm. kind of trees shrubs shrubs might do okay but uh, miscanthus grass is a really good option uh, where you need the height but you can't plant conifers or something like that so there's there's you know most of the options even conifers can fill in in six seven eight years and you're talking some guys talk about um you know doing doing burns on switchgrass is that something that is in your deck of cards as well or is that more for no. like a bedding type application <laughs> no it's uh so switchgrass it even if it, like the old school of thought was you plant five or six pounds per acre Deer will bed in it because it's not that thick. Mm -hmm. But deer have to have browse. So they have to have, they don't eat switch. They don't eat Indian grass, blue, big blue stem, little blue stem. They don't eat any grass. Um, so you have to have forbs, forages, early successional growth of shrubs, trees mixed in there. And if you have that to an appreciable amount where there's browse, then there's not enough cover from the switch to provide cover. So really you want solid switch just for screening and blocking um, hunter access. And there's a lot better mixes if you plant, even if you plant a 10 acre field, you can have diversity pockets where you have early successional growth pockets growing in the switchgrass. And then you have that best of both worlds. That makes sense. Okay. Got it. Any other questions on, uh, we'll move on to the next one. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. This is kind of a similar thing. Tips for setting up small kill plots in the right location. This is from 97 Chad. Is that you? Is that your alias? On is that is not. 97 not. Chad? I know who that it is. is so. no. uh, you know who it is? Yeah. Okay. To me, a kill plot's not a kill plot unless it's on the way to something else because you don't want deer to linger. If they're there for 45 minutes, if it is the stopping point, then they just eat it down to the dirt and there's no movement at all. So you can get away with a pretty small plot that doesn't have an appreciable amount of food if it's on the way to a big food source. So I call those holding plots. And uh, everyone refers to a destination field. A destination field, most of them I see are nocturnal plots because people hunt them too much. They're mm -hmm. walking in them. And our neighbor's ag fields are destination food sources. I want a holding plot that actually holds the deer till dark and then releases them after dark to go somewhere else, my neighbor's ag field, neighboring uh, public land, whatever it might be. So that hunting plot is a perfect fit if you can add it to that movement on the way to a holding plot between bedding areas and that holding plot. And, um, and so that's one factor of the um, kill plot. It's, it's got to be just a window into their movement. And when it is, then they're just stopping for a short little bite and they're moving on. Mm -hmm. I'd never add a water hole or a mock scrape in a holding plot because you're ruining the chance for a, uh, an attraction on the way to that holding plot. And so 
um, in a little kill plot though, sometimes adding a water hole, especially if it's a micro plot with just some clover, a mock scrape and a water hole might be a very um, appropriate addition because it's especially when you can't add that somewhere else. You know, ideally you'd have a water hole mock scrape combination, a kill plot, and then a, uh, a holding plot. So you're lengthening that line and giving yourself more stand location, potentially even more access routes and wind area, you know, areas to blow your wind. So really important that it's on the way to something else. Also that you can get in and out of the stand without potentially spooking deer on there, or at least your access to the stand is covered. Uh, quiet stands, so you can get out even if a deer is 50 yards away and moving on, you can get out of the stand at dark. Um, kill plots, think of those as maybe you can even get in though into those in the morning if it's far enough removed from that holding plot where they might be slipping through during the morning hours, you know, 100, 200 yards away. Mm -hmm. So something very uh, sacred, your downwind is blocked, maybe open hardwoods, a field, a horse pasture, a river, a lake. Mm -hmm. So your downwind's blocked, good access, and it's just a window of movement on the way through. And, uh, and that way your food will last longer and then maybe add that mock scrape onto it or a water hole if you can't add it somewhere else just to sweeten that movement. Where we recorded the video where you shot Kermit, is that a perfect example of this? Yes, yep, that's a nice because we have the mock scrape actually off to the side <coughs> and then a small kill plot and then a two acre holding plot and then the ag fields. It mm -hmm. just stacks up accordingly. Mm -hmm. And we even shortened that two acre field, that holding plot a little bit so we could have solid switch on the downwind just so that it's a blocker. Mm -hmm. um, because again, deer don't typically bed in solid switch. They're not feeding there. So you can use it as an effective downwind to your stand locations too. Interesting. Next question. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll, do, we'll go with Kyle Dottie, 32. What food plot seed variety to plant based on different food plot sizes? Which I know is... Yeah, a, I like that very, question. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's good because it... Um, so I really like you have to cover your bases. So I look at the three founding food sources uh, for food plotting. The base should always be greens. So I'm looking for the most diversity that you can fit into the plot. And if you have leftover, then you can go to stage two. But that's the foundation. That's the food plot pyramid. You have to fill that foundation of greens first because greens of some si some variety can last the entire hunting season in attraction and um, nutrition as long as you have enough diversity. So then I'm looking at a lot of those green plots, even a quarter acre. I'm putting around here, be uh, half in brassica, the other half in late planted beans, peas, meaning late planted at the same time of brass as brassica sometime in August. And then I'm top dressing the beans, peas, and oats later with some rye just to add some more life to that, keep the deer off the brassicas. But then they have something on both sides in the same plot. You never want to plant different plots in different forages because then you have areas of dead spots on your property that aren't working for you because they're focusing on plots elsewhere on the property. That means your stands that relate to that movement, your bedding areas, travel corridors, mock shapes, water holes. Oh, it's really hard you're making your property a lot smaller yeah. because you're taking an 80 acre parcel or a 40 acre parcel and you're scattering out your food and then only a small portion of that property is being used at any one time because that food source is peaking at that moment so you put it all into that so once you have your green foundation and in up north where you need uh where there's not a lot of ag you don't have a lot of complementary food sources you might use something just like straight layered rye where you're trying to fill space horizontally not vertically and you can't use something like peas, late planted peas, late planted beans, um, certainly corn, even brassicas because they mow it down in the dirt before the season even begins. So you use something like rye that's most, and, and rye grain, not rye grass, wheat in a pinch too, but it's very browse tolerant, it grows in cold weather, poor soils, and it's the most <clears throat> browse tolerant. So what I started doing a long time ago is, um, you know, first frost was in early September in the UP, so about two weeks before that, it put 100 pounds down. 100 pounds down three weeks later, 100 pounds down three weeks later, just broadcasting on top, and that would help layer it. If you have food plot failure, you can throw that down at the same time. So that's that foundation of green, figuring out what's the best green in your area. And I really try to avoid summer, which is uh, the tip of the pyramid. I look at greens first, then corn if you have enough room. So if I have greens left over, then I want to add corn, and corn at least 50% of your of what the greens are. So if I had eight acres of greens, I'm going to add at least four acres of corn. If I had six acres and it seems like it's lasting, add three acres of corn, maybe cut down the greens an acre. But that's that second level. And it seems like corn fits just about anywhere in the north half of the country. And that's that, that's what we do here. That third part is anything summer. And so if you have enough greens 
and you have enough corn and you're trying to build a deer herd, then add that summer food source. But around tier, you do your do the deer dis- disservice if you're adding summer food source, say beans, um, clover, because you're taking deer off the ag fields around here and they should be spread out. They have more nutrition out there. They're heavily manicured, beautiful ag fields where the deer should be. They have the most volume and then they can spread out and it's low stress as opposed to sticking them in a three acre food plot all summer long with 15 other deer. Mm-hmm. It's high stress. I believe it diminishes their body weight, any kind of growth growth stress rules deer Mm -hmm. and so uh, that's that's why that's that last piece of the puzzle and a lot of times with people that have population problems or having trouble reducing herd population uh, that first step is to get rid of those summer food sources so that's the summer food source is a really really tough one for people to understand because they think they're helping the deer and even in remote areas northern minnesota wisconsin um, upstate new york the up and michigan in those areas, deer have five times more summer food than they need. And that's from John Azoga talking to me, famed deer research biologist, as you know, more peer-reviewed articles than anybody else ever in the country on deer research. But they have so much more food available in those areas. They live high in the hog all summer. We put a food plot out. It could create a situation where there's high stress. Does and fawns that eat, on, eat that food source all summer stick around, and it just multiplies the problem if you do have population problems. So, One question I have, and I <clears throat> think I... We probably know the answer to this, but forage uh, like per acre in your plantings, is that something that you're ever worried about when you're looking at, you know, whether you're looking at your layering approach and saying, okay, I'm going I'm to broadcast rye over this in October. Um, is that to make up for any lack of like tons per acre on the forage side, or is it just purely from an attraction? Yeah, it's a good question. They So <clears throat> when you're, part of it's timing too. So when you're adding late planted peas, beans, and really light oats, say 25 pounds of oats, 100 pounds of peas, 50 pounds of beans around August 1st in these parts. Um, Maybe Southern Ohio, that'd be August 15th, or Southern Illinois, uh, Northern Kentucky. Then at that same time is when you plant your brassicas. That's a brassica timing. So that might be on one half of the property, you know, beside uh, beans, peas, and oats. The other half might be brassica in that food plot. And then you're adding rye about five, six weeks later to the beans, peas, and oats side, and you're leaving space for that. Rye is a workhorse. But brass, brassicas should not be combined with wheat or rye, any grain, because they're different planting types. If you put that rye in that mix early, it's going to choke out the other uh, plants that are in there, and it's going to reduce the volume in the overall plot. So you see a lot of poor food plot mixes if they have rye in it, wheat, and then they add rape and turnip and and radish is all in the same mix, there, there's two fighting, and, the, and Nebraska loses in that. The, the rye wins and takes nutrients, so you, you lack volume in that. But So part of it's just timing, spacing it out. At the same time, rye is at workhouse horse where if the beans, peas, and oats are eaten down to the dirt, any time during the season, that rye is still going to be there. And even you get a slight warm-up in December where it warms up to 40, 50 degrees and sunny, then that rye is going to actually add volume. It's actually going to grow where nothing else will. In the springtime, when deer are getting out of the winter, rye and wheat, they're the only products that are going to be available before spring green up. So that's the most missed time in the food plot woods, um, two to four weeks before spring green up. Clover's not woken up yet. It wakes up at spring green up. So two to four weeks before that, that rye is available. And we saw that with deer returning from the deer yards up in the UP of Michigan. They're hitting the rye just pounding the rye we're collecting deer and then as soon as spring green up to the deer are gone because they have food everywhere and you go from 20 deer on the rye side of the plot to two deer on the clover side of the plot because everything's spread out they don't actually need that clover it's just a couple resident does so it's really doing both i mean the layering yes. approach with different dates is helping the other plantings reach more volume yes because of the attraction so it's a I mean, long term throughout the year, it's it's really it's both. another step. Yeah, but um, it it adds to your springtime nutrition and um, herd recovery after the winter, and then also increases volume. Yeah. And another thing too, when the brassicas are getting they're getting good volume, and let's say the beans, peas, oats are getting hit down, you're establishing that pattern of use. They're hitting the candy crops of the beans and peas. Pretty natural for them to step over too early and start hitting the brassica and reducing the volume. About that time, you're adding a reinforcement layer of rye, usually 200 pounds per acre. They love that fresh young rye. 
and you're trying to keep the attention off the brassica. So you're just trying to maximize volume, attraction, diversity, nutrition, all in the same food plot at the same time with different forages and using those timings appropriately. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, <clears throat> which kind of ties into, uh, he kind of answered it, but B. Erickson says, why does he think it's a bad idea to feed the deer on his property year-round, which is a maybe a misleading way to say it, but nonetheless, I think you probably get the essence of what he's trying well, to say. Well, I'll start this. Uh, <laughs> it's a bad idea um, on my property. I hope all my neighbors do it because you don't have enough space to feed deer all year round. They need different types of habitat during the summer versus the fall, especially when it comes to bucks. And when I, when I would add summer food out here, I'll create a doe factory problem. I'll create excessive does and fawns. I'll increase the population. That's a bad thing. I just want to have a moderate population, a balanced population. At the same time, then if I have summer food sources and they're appreciable and they're high quality, they're at the expense of my fall food sources. You can't build a deer herd in June, July, August in any way. My neighbors think they can or might because they're holding the majority of the bucks right now. We hold all the majority of the bucks in the fall. The previous landowner here is a great example. Um, he had the land for seven years on the real estate listing. 20 out of 25 buck pitchers were in velvet. And that was actually a little concern. You know, you always look at it, why, why is this happening? And it was pretty easy. They planted five acres of beans, and they had it in three or four plots. Those beans were down to the dirt in October. They had more does and fawns than bucks. And for that, they had to rely on just random cruising in November. They weren't a herd influencer. They weren't capturing bucks during the fall. They weren't attracting them, holding them, advancing them to the next age class. So they weren't really doing any good, and they had over 300 acres. And so it was it was really limiting their potential success. So we got rid of the beans, got rid of the summer food, added uh, – you know, we had eight acres of greens last year, we which none during the summertime. And then uh, we had three and a half acres of corn on top of that. And so that allowed us to be the herd influencer in the area and build. We ended up finding uh, 22 sheds on the property last year uh, because of the corn, because of the greens we had. We had enough food lasting through. Uh, the summer food is, you know, another thing too. We have lots of ag land around here. And so, again, like I talked about with a previous question, if we're taking deer off that ag land to put in our little food plots, we're adding stress to the deer herd. That ag land is higher nutrition, higher volume. It's professionally manicured by the local farmers. Those deer need to be on there during the summertime. And then, so that's just ag land. People say, well, you know, I live in the big woods up north. Well, the big woods up north, per John Azoga, per deer research biologist, there's five times more food in those northern settings than the deer can actually consume or need. So... You think in the UP of Michigan, it's this big wilderness area. We're putting in food plots. We're helping the deer when really they have all the food they want. In the entire area, you're not doing anything to body weights, lactation rates. In fact, in areas with predators up north during the summertime, what a disservice to the deer. When you're attracting deer to these small plots that become predator traps for wolves and coyotes and bobcats and cougars. So you're, you're putting deer in a situation, young fawns in small food plots up north where there's predators. You, they don't need to be there. You're not doing anything good for the health of the herd, whether it's an ag land. The one exception is, say, Texas, where it's arid, maybe areas of Oklahoma, Arizona, where their limiting factor is the summertime. So that's when you can change. Everything's dry. There's hardly anything green. They're waiting for fall rains and winter rains. So completely opposite down there. But that's, boy, we're talking 2 3% of the entire deer world. Yeah. Um, the rest of the world... You know, where there's summertime, you think of all the food that must be in Georgia, Alabama, West Virginia, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee. It's warm, hot, but there's green, lush vegetation everywhere. The deer are living high in the hog all summer long. So there's a lot of complexity to that, but there's many reasons why summer food, everyone wants to help the deer herd. I know it feels good, but in reality, I get paid to deliver results for my clients and be right, not just support an idea that's accepted in the hunting industry, even though no one knows why. So I, I, I have to help my clients. And for that, I'm, if I thought beans would be great or clover during the summertime right around here, you can bet I would do anything possible right. to maximize the investment we have in our land. I'm not planting it for the fun, you know, for the fun of it. I, I, we're doing so much work already. Mm -hmm. It'd be much easier just to throw out some clover and alfalfa mix and just mow instead of spraying and planting buckwheat and then uh, smashing that down in the season. I, have a, I add a lot more layers because... It's all geared towards October, November, December. And if you're hitting that well, then you're going to carry over into January, February, March well, and you're actually making an impact vulnerable. on the herd. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I think part of the hang-up is 
you know, there's a lot of folks out there. Well, if I have the does, the bucks are going to be here in November, and that's when I hunt. Like, I'm, I'm a rut hunter. Yeah. I have to take my yeah. seven day vacation, and I need does, so I'm going to plant summer. The summer more food. does there are, the more that'll be in heat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that the, type the, of exactly. Yeah. And the, I think that just the part that they don't think about is there's food everywhere they turn, and like to your point, why go out there and do the work and plant these food plots? And like you're using your time, your money, your equipment. If you're next to ag. Let your neighbor, na- like let your neighbors, let your neighbors feed them. There's food everywhere here. If the structure or big on woods your- and in wilderness, yeah, let, exactly. Let the native, yeah, the federal land, the state land, the state or whatever land. it might be during the summertime. It's very limited during the fall and winter, exactly. But during the summer, that's when it is peaking. Right. And uh, you know, along with that too, just just think of a 40 acre parcel. Obviously, if there's a hundred does and fawns on it there's no room left over for bucks and mm-hmm. bucks don't like that stressful situation. The older they get, the, want, the more they want to remove them stru- mm-hmm. themselves from that. So during a 10 day or p- 10 day period, they're looking for does and fawns, but even then they don't want a lot of stress. Right. They don't want to be around all those does. So what I found is, you know, a 40 acre parcel, you can only fit so many does and fawns and that doesn't matter if we have 245 acres here. But what you find is if you have high quality fall and winter habitat and fall and winter food too, and cover, then those does are typically just on the outskirts somewhere hitting summer food, whether it's in the woods, on the neighbor's fields. And then they slowly trickle back through October and November, and there might be almost all of them in the, in the area in December. But what I found is that there's a, there's a number of does and fawns that, that hits a balance, that you have this number of does, you're going to have this number of mature bucks or bucks in general focusing on your land. When you start to raise that doe number above that, the amount of bucks you have on your land focusing in the daylight takes a dive proportionately. And so you want to look for that balance. Not having summer food is one way to find that balance. I find a lot of people that don't have enough tags to shoot enough does, but they're planting 12 acres of beans and summer food. And it's just exacerbating the problem. So they have to get rid of the summer food first, and then you find that they don't have to practice a lot of trigger control. You know, around here last year, I can honestly say we had more bucks on the property than does, and part of it's we didn't focus on that summer food, and so and we had lots of bucks. You know, mm-hmm. they want they want an area they can call their own. Now, if does and fawns aren't on the property, it tells you it's not attractive, and it's not it's not going to attract bucks on either. The bucks are not there because of the does; they're there because the track the habitat's attractive. And if there's too many does there, those bucks won't be there. It's a hard concept for people to understand, but it's not that you're not going to have any does during the hunting season. It's just you want to produce a balanced herd. I, I strongly believed in QDM principles in the end of the 90s. I think I was member not, number 9,200 or something, <laughs> and I think I joined in 98, 99. But it always goes back to you want a balanced uh, sex ratio as much as possible, balanced buck age structure, and a population maintained in balance with the habitat. So you're always going back to that. If you can find that balance, then you're going to have a great herd. And, and that's all relative. It depends, you know, what your neighbors are doing and everything else. But a lot of times when you're adding those summer food, you're creating a problem for yourself if, you, if you're looking for balance. Yeah, that's all really good information. And I think uh, it's extremely timely as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah the, right now, <clears throat> this is a kind of interesting question from Evan Long, 1990. Have, have you ever made any type, tor- type of mock scrapes on public ground, like using vines and tying something on there? It, uh, I'm trying to think, I haven't used a vine on public ground and <clears throat> it depends on what state you're in for how legal yep. it is to do so. Um, even just, a f- even just simply tying a vine that you bring from somewhere else then you're introducing a foreign material to the area yeah but if you could just tie something on a tree you know and that was acceptable then uh that would be great to do so so you really have to check with your local conservation officer i know in the up of michigan there's one that i used to work with um and he was a real fair person and even you know in a blind You'd go out there and someone would have some shooting lanes cut, just minor little saplings and stuff. He wouldn't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Um, It was when you're doing something excessive. So I think it depends on your local CEO. A lot of them, I mean, they're they're human. So they understand. And uh, if you're not doing anything to damage the woods. But, you know, even around here, we had mineral licks that were left illegally by the previous landowners. And so my first call was, you know, to find out from local DNR officer, what do I have to do with these? Do I have to get a skid steering and remove the soil? And 
they said, no, you can tell if it was, you put it there this year or if it was put there last year and, you know, not to worry about it. It wasn't wasn't a big deal. We saw those gents out of breakfast this morning at Perkins. What's that? We saw the COs at breakfast oh, really? this morning. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. We've used mock scrapes on, on public. Um, With any success? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Although, yeah, they'll get good success. <laughs> yeah, the, um, uh, when we were there last year and on that one set where I told Russ to go that morning, that was a mock scrape set on mm -hmm. the – not really in a saddle, but on the, kind of on the end of a point that flattened out to a, a long flat ridge, um, j just adjacent to a, a clear cut. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, tons of tons of uh, photos on that on that camera. Now we've done both the vines. I like the beech trees just because in that area it seems like that's what they're hitting naturally. Yeah, it and looks it looks more natural than. So yeah, those beech trees like in southern Ohio. I mean, the, in and even northern Michigan. Um, Anywhere there's beech trees and you don't have, and that's the hardwood of the area, they love to rubber scrape under them. And then it's just yeah. a matter of breaking a branch that's exactly. out hanging in the right height and, right. and clearing the ground, and they'll hit it. Yeah. So it's yeah. it works pretty well. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I've seen – people have shown me videos, pictures of vine scrapes on public land. I never ask if it's legal, mm -hmm. but, uh, of course, it works. Yeah, it's, sure. Uh, depending on what state they're in. But, yeah, it works in every state. It's just – I think people take chances and <laughs> so. Yeah, you had to look into, uh, disclaimer on the mineral though, you had to look into the Franz Buck in Iowa. Um, a gentleman bought a parcel, and I might watch this a little bit. The Steve Franz Buck from a couple years ago? No, nah, no, it was a guy, it was the. It was a giant buck. Out like of six, Iowa with a muzzleloader. Yeah, that's Steve Franz. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm pretty I sure. his first yeah. name. But yeah. he bought a parcel, had a mineral site, he called the DNR, DNR said, uh, actually he said it was okay, whatever, and then he still went out and like tarped it off, put a tarp over it. He filled it in, put a tarp over it, basically did everything he could. And then um, he shot that giant deer, got a bunch of publicity. And there's obviously hearsay and rumors of uh, someone was disgruntled. And then he actually got in trouble for it. Buck got taken away. And then. Jeez, I didn't know any of this. Yeah. It's, what a shame. Yeah. Yeah, it was very controversial. Yeah. And then uh, he had to basically prove his innocence in the court of law. And then they actually pulled the satellite images and saw that, like, he indeed covered it up. So, yeah, wow. real real crazy thing. Wow. So that's the I think that's Iowa, too. Yeah, well, that's a different state, yeah. Yeah, Iowa. Iowa. I mean, yeah. Meaning they I've heard of tough things like that. Yeah. You know, it depends on where you're at. Yeah, I just thought that was, that was crazy. Hmm. Crazy thing. Okay. I think you have to watch your window tinting in Iowa, too. Oh, really? Just saying. <laughs> 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 Where other states, they might not care. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyways. That's funny. I, have, I have a random question. You've traveled all across the country. If you had to pick a place in the United States, if you could pick any any part of the United States to buy this farm, like if you could lift this farm, put it somewhere else, where would you put it, or would you leave it right where it's at? That's a good question. I like it would leave it right where it's at uh, because I love being able to hunt Wisconsin and Minnesota, and I don't like hot weather. <laughs> so I'd rather be in a cooler northern setting. Um, Deer-wise, that rules out. Um, now there's areas of southwest Pennsylvania that are awesome. Um, you know, Ohio is, western Ohio is, I, I get um, oh, east of uh, Columbus and, or, you know, eastern Ohio. But eastern, I love that area down there. Um and down, I stay in like New Philadelphia, Ohio, a lot for clients. I've seen some monsters though east of Columbus where um, they're seeing 200 inch deer every year. And so my goal has never been to shoot a 200 inch deer every year. I know hunters that won't hunt an area unless there's 200 inch deer, and it's mm -hmm. just that's not me. Uh, but there's areas where a 200 inch deer is a lot more common than people think. Um, I have clients that see a 200 inch deer just about every year. Wow, that's insane. Yeah, just about every year. And if there's not one on their land, they there's one, one just yeah. a neighbor away or a neighbor yeah. or two away. Yeah. And so people think that it's a one in 100,000 deer. Well, it is unless you're in the right area. And the right area is several counties in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Iowa, Kentucky, Kansas, Ohio, Missouri. Everywhere. Yeah. Just, I mean, literally, <laughs> yeah. Indiana. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I know I'm missing some states, yeah. too, so I apologize. But <laughs> there's... Uh, there's a lot more 200 inch yeah. areas than, than you just find think. that they're usually in pockets of specific terrain or is it areas? It's, it's kind of like weird because over in uh, Vernon County where we, we hunt in Wisconsin, um, in our area, the biggest buck I've seen in 11, 12 years is 184. A neighbor shot one that was 187. 
but then you go down to where we hunted 20 miles to the to the southeast and the first year we had a 214 inch on the property and a 190 mm-hmm. so or in and around though 214 was on the property i have good pictures of them so mm-hmm. it was uh just that first year you know and that's an area where they just they're a little bit elevated someone shot 190 inch nine point it was what? whoa <laughs> that's a giant wow so yeah there's there's just pockets like that, and it can seem like everything else is the same, but it all goes back to, I mean, boy, if you can have 170, 80-inch, 160-inch bucks all the time on the property, I love this area. Mm-hmm. I love being by the Mississippi. I like uh, the rural areas. I'm not uh, big into being by big cities like Columbus or something. Um, somewhere like Kansas would be too hot for me, Kentucky. Kentucky has some monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, just uh, going down there and hunting with the Hunt Wise crew down at the, where we go down there, but... but uh, yeah, I, I love this area. I really do. And the fact that we can just jump across the river and hunt both states is mm-hmm. that's nice. With normal tags, no draws. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I was expecting you to say Iowa or something like everyone else. <laughs> no, it's too easy. <laughs> too I mean it's no, it's not too easy. It's just I don't want to live there. Yeah. Um this is beautiful around here. I love the bluffs. Um it is gorgeous. I here. like the three hundred and fifty, four hundred and fifty foot change in elevation. I don't like uh big, huge sprawling ag where you can see for miles. I'd rather have some woods and and mm-hmm. uh, terrain. Do you think that's a product of growing up in Michigan, in Honey, Michigan? I don't know. I, you know, we grew up going up to Pitchard Rocks in uh, northern yeah, yeah. Michigan, or, uh, Mackinac Island, and I just I've always loved the how the hills, natural beauty, the water, mm-hmm. and so to me, like I get into an area where it's just all ag everywhere you see, and there's not a lot of water, and it's just I don't know. I feel feel kind of out of place. Throw in some cities, it's even worse. So, mm-hmm. La Crosse is my kind of big town, town of fifty thousand. That's it. Oh, that's so, it. Seem- I'm thinking Madison. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Madison. So you have Milwaukee, <laughs> Madison, <laughs> Lacrosse, like east to west, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah kind of yeah. Madison South and right. but uh um but yeah, Lacrosse is I don't even know what the population is in Madison's. It's it's huge. We Milwaukee, drove through huge. Wisconsin a few times, but on this trip it felt like we we're with fe- people everywhere. Yeah, at the southern portion of yeah. the state, it just felt like we could never get out of suburbia. But I think yeah. we just kept circling Milwaukee. <laughs> 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 North of Milwaukee, was, south of Milwaukee, west was, of Milwaukee. That was part of it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was part of it. Gotcha. <clears throat> let's see. Um, let's keep looking through here. What are what are uh, Wisconsin mountain man? Uh, what are three top pieces of hunting gear for 2021? Well, it's interesting. Um, so getting into First Light, one of the things that I've really appreciated about them, and I know other companies offer this, they, they've they got about five base layers of merino wool. And I have all five. So I was able to use them all <laughs> last year from uh, Henleys to quarter zips to long sleeve T-shirts to T-shirts. There's a lot of times it's 85 degrees and I, they have really lightweight merino wool t-shirts and I'm wearing those on client properties. And uh, I love the fact the wind whips right through them, but there's a little bit of insulating property to them too. Um, so that's that's a huge favorite of mine. Now, something that's been around forever, but I, I love using bibs. And so, um, you know, they, they have the catalyst system at first light, which is like a norm midweight. And... I'm typically hunting when it's cold. You know, I hunt cold fronts all year. So you get a, say, a 52-degree day at the end of September, I'm out there. And that means that I need some kind of base layers, warm layers. I'm using something zip up that I can, you know, quarter zip that I can unzip. So I find it pairs well with bibs where, you know, I'm covered, my midsection's covered, but then I can zip it down almost my crotch if I want to walk in and I'm hot. And you can let a lot of steam out. It's pretty easy. And, uh, and then... Uh, I, I'm a huge vest fan. So it's obvious to say this is a warm jacket. You wear it. Mm-hmm. That's, everyone has warm jackets. But when you can layer uh, many different layers of merino wool, so I'm using like a heavy layer uh, quarter zip and then a mid-weight um, next to skin. And then I'll use a vest, like they have real thin down vest. And then I wear my jacket and bibs. And so between that, you've got... Uh, wind resistant with a say like a nylon um, um, down thin vest and then you have the insulating layers that are under that a couple of them you have the protection of your midsection with bibs and then you're throwing your winter coat on you know over that and so those those layering aspects and then i i'm never out in the woods without my hand warmer tube 
So first light didn't have a hand warmer tube last year. They just, so I they took just a, released one, I think. They did, mm -hmm. yeah. They had Greg Farrell, the whitetail manager, he sent me a text and said, you finally got your wish or something <laughs> like that. I forget what he said. I asked if I got royalties. I didn't get any response. So, uh, But uh, I went to the fleet farm and got this cheap. We bought a couple of the hand warmer tubes. They're just cheap ones. But then I, I bought the first light waterproof gators and wrapped mm -hmm. those around it. So, ah, so then you have that waterproof wind re resistant yeah. layer. And I've done that for years too. I mean, going back, I have some Cabela's gators that I got in the mid nineties, maybe that were waterproof mm -hmm. and wrapped those around cheap, uh, mm -hmm. hand rubber tubes back then. But that carries my grunt call, oh, my phone, my SD cards. Yep. It's uh that's your backpack. Yeah. And that's all I wear. I don't, I'm a real minimalist. Yeah. And so I think some of the backpacks I've had in the past, uh, hunting backpacks, it's like another person sitting in the tree with you. And when you already have a cameraman, I don't want three people out yeah. there. And if the cameraman has one, it's like we're having a party up there. Mm -hmm. Right. So one of the, the unique things about, you know, different layering systems, I think we've just gotten into, our, I'm not sure about Jake, but probably in the last five to six years, um, as you start adding these pieces into your collection, Guys will say, like, in the late season, well, why do I need to wear – I don't – why do I need to buy five five of these things? I'm just going to go buy the biggest, warmest sleeping bag-like jacket or, or pants or bibs, and I'll, I'll be warm. But what they don't realize, like, as you're adding these pieces in, like, you're covering any weather condition throughout the entire length of season. Like, you, you know, you start with lighter weight base layers, and then you have a mid-weight, and then you add an insulation piece, then you have an outer shell. Yeah. So it's – it's way, uh, I guess, multidimensional when you look at it from being applicable to several different weather scenarios, several different temperature scenarios, uh, kind of spread out throughout the season. It's not just I need this for you know for late season for you know twenty degrees and and under. I think well, that's, that's pretty unique. You know, it's kind of interesting too. You bring that up because uh, your base is your foundation. Mm -hmm. They refer to them as foundation layers. A lot of people start with their heavy coat and then go inward. Right. You really should work inward. You should be wearing almost the same type of base, um, regardless of when it is during the season. You're just adding layers to make it more comfortable right. outside of that. So that's where you have the light, thin layer, the heavyweight, the vest, the bibs, and then the heavy coat, not the other way around. It's mm -hmm. like everyone, a lot of people don't think about those base layers. And if you don't have those correct, then you're not going to be warm, regardless of the outer layer. 100%. Were you pointing this one or waking up the computer? Yeah, I t um, well, Chad had asked. <laughs> no, I was just pointing. That's a cool computer. Oh. <laughs> no, no, the uh, um, Chad had asked something about fire earlier. Yeah. And I saw that. And yeah. Alex is, uh, hi, Alex. <laughs> but anyways, uh, he's always on YouTube or different um, different social media, so mm -hmm. Instagram. But um, the uh, uh, fire in switchgrass, mm -hmm. I always mow. So mowing is, you know, May. There's someone I know in uh, Michigan, David Bryce, he, he uses a zero turn on his switchgrass almost every May because if there's any weeds in it at all, you mow it. Um, we mowed out here already this year, several of our switchgrass areas, um, areas that d didn't need it. We didn't mow. We had one field I showed you guys was a big L. Mm -hmm. One all planted the same, all treated the same, all chemically controlled the same. One portion was weedy. Um, three quarters of it wasn't. So we just left that alone. And so, but mowing, you can see now, those broadleafs have a tendency to keep pace with the switchgrass and even shade them out a little bit, limit growth. But once you mow it, two weeks later, the switchgrass is six inches higher than the broadleafs, and mm. it, you never look back. So you can solve just about anything with mowing when it comes to switchgrass rather than burning. Burning is a higher risk. takes a different skill level. I just prefer not to do it. It looks really cool on social media. <laughs> but other than that, and then when it gets into fire in general, fire in your timber produces a lot of green forbs and forages those are all gone during the winter time so a lot of people will favor fire over say timber harvest um or hinge cuts if needed not every i mean only 20 30 percent of properties need hinge cutting but some type of timber manipulation or cutting uh, people refer prefer burning to that and a lot of those forbs and forages you're burning in a hardwoods or a mature timber stand are gone during the fall again going back to what's great in the summer isn't necessarily great in the fall and you can't design a property in that that even goes to weeds and food plots weedy food plots weeds and food plots of course you're going to like those during the summertime because they're available they're fresh they're green so various forms of weeds that their brows are you know attractive or brows uh, tolerant they'll grow fast hardy they'll grow in your food plots makes your food plot more attractive during the summertime but they all die and you could have a weedy food plot 
let's say you have 10 acres. Well, if you have 50% in weed growth, you're probably going to have 10% in the volume of your food plot. So going into the fall, you only have one acre of food in that food plot, really, of your targeted food out of 10 acres, and you just wasted your food plot. So in November, you have one acre work, working for you instead of 10. So, um, you know, weeds sometimes uh, increase in vegetation during the summertime in hardwoods. You know, you have to ask yourself, the deer hitting this now, but is it filling the holes in the bucket that are the lowest when it comes to the deer season and uh, and when the deer actually need that habitat the most? So uh, let's, do, do you ever try to, do you, do you ever prescribe burning in hardwood settings or areas that have already been cut to help cl like clean up? Typically tops not because you don't need to. Okay. So a lot of times um, in, in those tops and debris, that's a good question. You know, the, um, if, if you're a fisherman out there and you have a drop off on a, it's a, it's a sandy wide open drop off. You add a couple old Christmas trees. You're going to attract all the fish in the area pallets. Mm -hmm. If you had a, you know, a dock floating dock, uh, pile of rocks down below just more structure creates more uh, fish it's the same with wildlife when you have structure it can be too thick for deer so that's a time where um, you go in with a forestry mulcher mulch areas down if you have to but most of the time if timber practices are done correctly um, they're leaving tops and debris and that's a good thing because that's an immediate side structure that deer need and so they'll relate to just no different i was in a um, hardwoods in michigan this year and there's a blowdown in the middle and it was next to a slight, small clearing, big mature tree blew down, and there's probably 50 deer beds around it. No more deer beds within a couple hundred yards because it's all open timber. Mm -hmm. There's no regeneration, no growth, no additional browse, but it was that side cover, and they're just relating to it like fish on the bottom of a drop-off. Mm -hmm. And you see that on public land a lot where there's a lot more mature timber, and you have a little bit of structure on a, in the right place and a little knoll or, or bench system. And they'll have deer there. So um, I like keeping those logs, tops, and debris. And if you have the sunlight hitting the ground, hitting the ground, then you're going to get a lot of great natural regeneration and growth in the forest without having to take that added step to go in and burn. So even if it did produce another 5% in quality or 10% in quality on top of the cuttings and top of the sun that was already there in the regeneration, there might be other projects that are more worth your time or valuable to your, your efforts um, on your property. Interesting. How are you on time, Lucas? So we are 46 minutes in. Want to uh, do a blitz section? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, you guys do that? Yeah. We always uh, talk about implementing it, but I mean, um, I'm trying to think. Let Picking location for Licking Branch. Yeah, okay, so. Uh, That's an easy one. Well, yeah, did we do that one? I think we did. No, we didn't. Okay, no. It was yesterday. We did it yesterday. <laughs> I know. I was going to fresh. <laughs> okay, quick. Uh, picking location for Licking Branch. One at every stand location. You don't need any more than that. In fact, uh, if you have more than that, it could draw away from those areas where you want to be able to shoot, a, shoot it. So I, I look at it like you should be able to hit those with your bow, um, every one of them, and a camera on it. Mm -hmm. uh, potential for a camera on it. Sure. Um, let's see. I don't know if this is a blitz. I'm blindly reading this hunting deer on small acreage that's not staying on you mid to late season dustin underscore johnson 94 that's a tough one because it depends on what your resources are if you can add food or not because deer are always going to be attracted to food but that being said if you can't do anything um the second rut in early december is the most missed time in the deer woods mature bucks will range far and wide they still mm -hmm. know what the game is compared to yearling bucks and then um i had a really opp nice opportunity um I think it was mess up number five last year in Wisconsin. I got I got my money's worth out of my bow tag in Wisconsin <laughs> last year, but uh, the third one in early no, uh, early January, that buck came through making scrapes, making rubs, tearing up the woods. He was hot and ready to ready to go. That was early January, and uh, he was a nice five year old, and uh, the rut was still in swing. And so when you have that small property, not getting much deer movement, leave it alone. Attack those uh, secondary rut, third uh, third rut. And uh, you might get some opportunities just because you've left your property alone until then. That's something that we see historically on trail cameras in certain areas. Like we're certain. At. Well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know where no, at. No, I see, I see it, same thing in Illinois too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just for I guess from additional insight, like if you've seen that on the past on your small piece, like that should be a, that note. should be in your playbook if yeah. it's happening, you know, year over year for whatever reason, whether and. Yeah, I mean, I, we've talked about spikes and, yeah. and and late born fawns and stuff on different episodes. And it's pretty it awesome. All, it all plays into, all plays into that. Especially a small parcel where you don't have the resources for food or cover. Mm -hmm. You're just hunting. You're looking for random movement. Mm -hmm. Buck fever, outdoor production. What types of terrain do you look for when you're e scouting 
an area for bedding. It's interesting. What I've always looked at with public land, this is what I've been writing about videos for a long time, is uh, going back a decade or more, is what I look for are areas of common area. So I'm looking at a 5,000 acre area and I'm trying to X out 4,600 acres of that and leaving me 400 acres to look at. And so meaning that all the common areas, the areas next to roads, uh, big open swamps where a deer can't live, big, big open hardwoods where there's no cuttings, uh, maybe near access trails, you're Xing that all out. You're just taking it all out. So you don't even consider what the terrain is, what the funnels are in those locations if it's near a road, if it's near a parking area. So then it narrows it down to just a few hundred acres. And in there, I'm looking for constrictions of land, um, elevation change, if there's any. But I'm really looking for where the most type of habitat types come together. So if it's lowland meeting upland, uh, old growth forest eating, meeting uh, clear cuts, change in habitat type, you're looking for as many of those variables, uh, water, no water, coming together at one spot. And so, and that's typically where you find the most diversity that's hidden away from roads, away from deer access trails or hunting access trails. Um, you can you can eliminate most public land areas. You can take 5,000 acres and narrow it down to 500 pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Identify three or four areas in there that look remote and feature different habitat types. Just focus on those. Go in quick. Look for old historical sign. That's more important than sign of the moment or sign last year. If you can see a years of rubs in those areas. Um, obvious scraping activity, then then you have found a spot. So there's a few rubs on this farm. Yeah, we saw <laughs> we saw a couple yesterday. Three yeah. miles worth. Yeah, yeah. honestly. <clears throat> yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Real qu uh, give a give this person subpar underscore hunter. That's actually a funny name too. Uh, tips for the South. Maybe give them one real good key takeaway. You know what's interesting is uh, the concepts I look at. Deer relating to each other. Deer relating to hunters. They're all the same, whether it's north or south. Um, what's interesting I find in the South is that there's vegetation and growth everywhere. Typically, unless it's the arid South, meaning Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona, somewhere there, New Mexico, whatever it might be. Um, and so quality food still goes a long ways. And so I'm looking for areas that have something different than the local vegetation's offering. Maybe that'd be, um, some type of bean or corn, in those areas. What I find too is because there's so much food everywhere, you still have that period of time in the fall where the vegetation is dying. And when you get into Kentucky, West Virginia, Tennessee, sometimes actually clover is not a bad option because clover will still be producing in December um, or alfalfa, some type of legume where um, you can still get growth throughout the entire fall, but it's not that great of an impact during the summertime because there's so much growth everywhere as that native vegetation is dying and, and dying back then something like clover can really stick out and it's low maintenance something that we can't use traditionally in most areas of the upper midwest just because it's not a favorable attraction during the winter time um, can really stick out in areas of the south mm -hmm. you want to answer this one <laughs> i don't know if there's any basis to it anyway <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I think um, I was really, you know, I've been a QDMA life member since 2004. Um, I really have a love for the old QDMA. It was based on those founding principles of QDM and, and how, how can we get that implemented. And I'm not really familiar with the NDA as much. I know personnel change. I was a huge fan of Brian Murphy. And, and I know things, uh, he was the old executive director of the QDMA for 25 years or whatever. I know stories of what he started out of the attic of his home, you know, with his wife and went to um, branch events or just meetings where he didn't even have enough money to drive home. He passed the hat basically to fund his transportation. So I appreciate those grassroots efforts. And um, I, th I think the more that you pull towards science in any kind of deer or wildlife, the more you pull away from the practicality and reality of what people deal with on the average parcel size across the country. And there's, there's something severely missing. I hope the NDA takes more the practical route um, going forward, um, not getting away from science, but actually getting into more experience on the ground experience and how that relates to the average land user. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really sure, you know, about the NDA and QDMA, the differences right now. 
um, you know, we had a charity event on Sunday, and that was for Kicking Bear, Camp Kicking Bear. And that's the mission. Their mission statement is um, to get a bow, a bow in a kid's hand and lead them and their family to the Lord. So it's about taking kids, underprivileged kids, kids from the Boys and Girls Club across, you know, local areas. They have chapters around different states. And so as I've grown in my whitetail business, my career, my passion, um, I've grown towards more, not that I don't support the QDMA or NDA, what they stand for, but I really like supporting something like that that involves kids, getting kids in the outdoors, hunter retention, hunter recruitment, um, getting hunters back that have been out of the sport for a long time. Those are all a mission of mine. And the way I see that happening is offering true information and in, in, in almost like to those people where you're trying to capture new hunters, retain hunters, bring hunters back into the fold. If you're giving them science, you're not doing that. That's just, they're, it's not real exciting. But when you're actually giving them information that actually helps them in the real world on those small properties that they hunt or on public land, look at all that the hunting public's done. Oh, you know, absolutely. that's, they're, they're almost like a mission. If you look at those, mm-hmm. those guys, and I have just huge respect for all of them, and they're not science-based, they're just going out there and getting it done and showing people how to hunt on public land their way. Mm-hmm. That's what retains hunter. That's what recruits hunters. And so I'm, I'm really focused more towards that. So like the kids' charities, kids' events. I'm not saying the NDA or something like that is not valuable. I just, you know, I, I, I joined the NDA or the QDMA in, um, in 99, 98. And that's a long time ago. There's been a lot of changes. And I, I, I miss the old way, old stuff, whatever way that was, just because that's what I'm familiar with. And, I, and as and I've grown in my career and my hunting, um, I just see what works and what actually reaches hunters. And, um, and so I like to spend my time in those areas. One of the things, um, I guess, personal opinion here, but one of the things that, you know, the the dissolvement, I guess, is the correct word, or the termination of the the, the QDMA, the, the forum, the forum part, like, and all the people that, you know, had contributed to building that. It's interesting, yeah. Like, that... That, that personally, that bothers me a little bit. I mean, I, I understand that they're from their, there's, you know, two sides to every story, two different, a couple different perspectives, and I understand their reasoning behind it. But at the same point in time, like if, you know, I was never a big contributor, but I would go there and read and look for different Im- information, follow different threads. And if I was someone who was um, very vocal, very active, and, you know, there were guys that put a lot of time into, into that forum, um, I think that, uh, I think that bought her a lot of people. And that's when that's that where was, people learn things. It, well, that's yes, and because exactly. it was practical. This is what yes, I'm doing. Yes, I, yes. I saw a leading scientist in the country the other day. He made a statement: uh, "Show me the data. Show me the science." When it came to opinions about deer management or deer hunting, and if you wait for the deer science and deer um, data, um, then you're going to be woefully behind and be misinformed when it comes to actual deer management and in the field, what actually works and experience. Mm-hmm. Um, you use the data when it comes to gestation periods or right. um, lactation rates or how an antler develops, uh, how a deer digests food or processes moisture. Yeah. Those okay, are all very important. <laughs> but when you get into uh, scientific data on buck movements, and it's a three-mile home range on average, and they've done this on collared studies of deer on thousands of acres of, of public or corporate land, and you try to apply that to 100 acres, it is, yeah. it is actually misleading, yeah. and, uh, and, and people aren't learning anything from that. And so when a scientist says, show me the data, and that's what they hold true, they can't learn or have any other opinions outside of that. That's the problem I see is that, uh, and that's where if you want to show new hunters the data, um, you're not going to attract them as new hunters. You're not going to retain old hunters and you're not going to get old hunters back into the fold yeah. because they want real information that's going to help them be a better hunter and science won't help them do that, unfortunately. And then you have like the political side of things like the NDA yeah. and, and like people, like regardless of what my opinion is, what your opinion is, people don't want to talk and involve themselves in politics and like that's just the end of the story like yeah i don't care enough to i'm over with that stuff you yeah know, it's kind so of it's, like yeah we want we want hunting for uh, an escape right so when you mm-hmm. have all those things kind of funneled together like who, know, who knows what the hell's gonna happen i don't think any of us really know just no sit by the sidelines i guess and, and we we have to, to have what... organ I, I mean nda is a leading white tail organization it's, right. Uh, right it's uh very critical that that science is critical um the continued learning of uh there's of so uh, deer and whitetails, 
But when you try to apply that um, to small parcels and the average hunter out there, there's a giant disconnect. Yeah. And so we shouldn't fake it and, and say that, that they that there is a connection there isn't this is this this is that they're two separate things and that's why i've been able to build a channel um mm -hmm. that's why it's you know i have so many subscribers on it and views every year and it's because i'm just you know i have a list on my phone right here that's you know when i look up my notes there's thousands of notes that i've taken over the last decade that are on here they're all topics that i find either when uh, viewers are asking questions on youtube or on social media or mostly when i'm out on clients clients repeatedly ask the same questions over and over again i think you know that'd be great to put, put a, create a video on mm -hmm. because in social media if you're not helping people with your content that you're creating you're doing nothing so if, if i'm creating content that's not helping anybody then and if people don't relate to it then they're not going to learn anything and, and it can't help them so you have to have that experience in the field. You have to see it and try to help people. And anybody out there that's creating digital content and you want to create a channel, you want to create a platform, if you're not offering something to help somebody and it's in depth, um, you're not going to be able to do so. So you have to find, find that experience. And without having that experience, how could you teach anybody? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we covered a, a wide spectrum uh, during this q yeah, So just want to thank everyone that took the time to write in a message. Thanks for taking the time yeah. to answer all the questions too. Yeah, it's always fun. Appreciate it. Appreciate the questions, everyone. Cool. Yeah, this is the first leg of a few, so uh, we'll wrap it up. Um, <laughs> we'll obviously link to uh, your projects, and just want to say thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it, guys. <laughs>